And so I just want to recap with you guys um, kind of the, some of the stuff we went over since we started. You know, we started with the, the idea that God has a plan for our money. And like I mentioned, when we first started, you know, the goal was to inspire you to believe God for your life when it comes to the area of your money and then inspire you to take action. You know, I mean, you can say that, oh, he's doing the classes. That means he may have everything together and everything perfect. But even preparing for these classes have, has inspired me to have more order and to make sure that all those boxes are checked off. And so the scripture we used to start was Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. It says, honor the Lord with your wealth and your first fruits and all your, and all your crops. Then your barns would be filled to overflowing. How many of you guys know that that sounds really good, right? So honoring God leads to a life of abundance. So the first class we went over was connecting. Allowing God access to the area of our money is foundational. The ability to link God with our financial situation can be, can be supernatural. Then we moved on to stewardship. When we responsibly plan, organize, and manage the money that God has entrusted us, uh, entrusted into us by taking advantage of opportunity. He gives us breakthrough and he gives us favor. And last week we talked about generosity and investing. Generosity is one of the keys to financial success, understanding that we all have a personal responsibility to multiply the resource and never forgetting to make room for God his house, and his people. And so today we're going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to go into legacy. And so Proverbs 13, says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. And I believe the only way that our money can reach our children's children is by teaching them the important things of life. I can sum up legacy in three words. Wealth, preparation, and education. Those three things are the key to transferring wealth to the next generation. The ability to pass down wealth with a planned structure to sustain it and the wisdom and value and principles to maintain God's blessing is key. I've always believed that God blesses us for a reason, for a purpose. And I believe that it's our responsibility that our children understand that. Now, I know that money is not the most important thing in life. It isn't. But the reality is, is without money, there's very little things that we can accomplish. And here in the church, without money, God's vision and plan that he's given our church and God's will is going to be very hard to be accomplished also. So... If you, if you can get this, if you understand this for your life, you'll be amazed at what God can do in your life when it comes to the area of finances. When your motivation for good stewardship and financial blessing is how much can I do for the kingdom of God, how much can I contribute to God's house, you'll be amazed at what God can do. So, uh, Gary Vanderchuk says, legacy, please think about it because you're writing it every day. So let's look at wealth. If you believe in good stewardship, then wealth will come to you. Wealth is a byproduct of good stewardship. You have to practice good stewardship, but if you do, eventually you will have to manage some amount of wealth. Luke 6, 16, 10, and 11 says, whoever can be trusted with very little can be trusted with much. But sometimes we don't have the right perspective when it comes to wealth because wealth is not something that you can see. The reality is wealth is hidden. Most people judge wealth by what they can see. But if you see anything that's attractive when it comes to money, what you're seeing is riches. Most people judge wealth by riches that people have. Um, the, uh, the author of, of The Psychology of Money says, 
The fastest way to feel rich is by spending lots of money on stuff. But the only way to get the real feeling of being rich is to actually have the money to pay for it. Not by paying for it through credit cards. And then you'll get the understanding that the stuff you're spending money on will eventually be worthless. Robert Kiyosaki says, money kept is more important than money earned. Why? It takes discipline to save your money, to invest your money. But I believe that wealth is easier built, is easier to build, rather, <clears throat> than you think. Last week we saw those investment models. If we just take a little bit of the money that we make every week, every month, we have the opportunity to build wealth. But it's a choice. A lot of us don't have a problem spending money on things, but when it comes to handing our money over to somebody else so that they could invest it for us, it's like, oh, I don't know about that. And so I picked up this little article and it says, things most wealthy people don't spend their money on. Smoking and drinking alcohol. Monthly subscriptions like apps and Hulu and Netflix and gym memberships. New cars. New cars lose 20 to 30% of value in the first year. Consumer debt. Buying things on credit cards and then just making minimum payments. <clears throat> impulsive, impulsive buying, whether that's in-store or online. They limit eating out. Entertainment. They don't upgrade their gadgets every time the, um, the mobile phone store tells you to. They don't spend money on entertainment. Oh, did I already say that? Maybe I already said that. They don't worry about keeping up with others. They don't spend money on lottery. They, not, they don't spend money on, ex, on excessive beauty, beauty projects, uh, sorry, products or procedures. They don't spend money on junk food. And they pay attention to high quality clothes versus high, high, -end, brand, high brand or high end brand clothing. And they don't worry about buying a house, <clears throat> excuse me, they don't worry about buying a house too fast or too big. In the books that we recommended, <clears throat> the index card is a good book for you to look into when you're thinking about buying a house. It gives you a lot of, um, a lot of the legwork that needs to be done when buying a house, a lot of the research. It kind of helps you to understand that. Morgan Household says, spending money to show people how much you have is the fastest way to have less money. A lot of times we don't consider that when, when we're managing our money. Proverbs 13, 7 says, There is one who makes himself rich yet has nothing, and one who makes himself poor and has great riches. In this book, The Psychology of Money, uh, the author uses a, an example of two people to represent the difference of looking and feeling rich and being wealthy. The first uh, person he uses is a man by the name of Richard Richard Foscon, and this man was a Harvard graduate. This guy made it big soon, early. He began to invest a lot of his money, and he made millions and millions of dollars. But he loved luxury. He loved living large. And before the market crash of 2008, he borrows millions of dollars to add on to his 18,000-square-foot home right before this market crashes, and it, leans, it leaves him in ruin. He ends up going broke, and at the end, they end up auctioning, auctioning off his house for 25% of the original value that he bought it for. In the same book, it talks about another man. This man, at 92 years old, he passes away, and he makes headline news. And the reason that he made headline news is because this man... You would have never expected it, but his net worth was over $8 million, and his profession was a janitor and a mechanic. This man lived in the same house, had the same family, invested his money, and his money just grew and grew and grew. And the big reason why he made headline news was not just so much because of his net worth, but because he decided to give 75% of that to charity. He had a plan for his money. 
And he also left his kids $2 million. That's a nice little gift. But this is what the book, The Millionaire Next Door, is all about. The average person living in average neighborhoods making good financial decisions. Proverbs 13, 11 says, This honest money dwindles away, dwindles away, but whoever gathers little by little makes it grow. You know, when my grandmother passed away, um, I talked about her a little bit last time. You know, my grandmother's profession was cooking, making tortillas, tamales, that kind of stuff. And when my grandmother passed away, she left her children a house that was paid for. She, uh, she, it was, she, had, she drove a nice car. And they thought that that was it. That's, you know, that's what my grandma left. And that was enough. You know, my grandma, you know, she was um, in her 40s. She had ended up getting divorced. And, you know, she didn't even know English. And so, but when they were cleaning out her house, they found thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. But the crazy thing about all the money they found in there was not that she didn't believe in banks, because obviously, right, she had all her money under her mattress. But the crazy thing was, is they found all the money in small bills, dollars, $5 bills, $10 bills, rolled up, put away in little envelopes, little notes on it. And what it was is all these years, all she did was save her money, save her money, put it away, put it away. And it took her kids days and days to count all this money. And you would have never expected it from my grandmother. So you can be just a single parent, single mom, single dad. And you can say, hey, you know what? I'm never going to manage that type of wealth that they're talking about. But the reality is it doesn't matter where we are in life. All of us have an opportunity to do well with money. So the second thing I want to look at is preparation. According to smart assets, there is 49 billion unclaimed funds in the United States. About 3 billion of that gets returned to its rightful owners each year, says the National Association of Unclaimed Property Administrators. That leaves 46 billion sitting in limbo in state government accounts. They say that some of this is from forgotten bank accounts, unclaimed delivered income tax refunds, insurance policy payouts that didn't get claimed. And there is an untold number amount of people that die and they don't have wills, they don't have trust, they don't have any um, instructions for anybody. So the government just takes over this, this money. So all this money is sitting there in the government's account just for a lack of preparation. So there's something that is called a legacy drawer, and I want to share that with you. Um, I don't have a legacy drawer, but I have what is a, is a binder that, you know, me and my wife discuss, talk about, we know where it's at. But it basically just organizes your information. You know, it organizes, it has everything from passwords to bank account information. It has, uh, you know, investment account information, insurance policy, just all the information that you would need in case something happens. It has phone numbers and services of different professionals that we use, from bankers to CPAs to attorneys, financial advisors, anybody that would help us with this area of our lives, their names and numbers are in there. There's also instructions. You know, for you to be able to have any type of instructions for your family or for, any, for you know, the, the, the money that you manage, the different, the different accounts and different things, you have to have the con those conversations with, with your wife, with your spouse, with your kids. Those hard conversations. What are we going to do if something happens? Who's going to get the kids? And these conversations and these, and these ins written instructions could just be temporary until you get the legal documents. The other thing is beneficiaries. Having proper beneficiaries on all the accounts that you have, all the life insurances, different things that you have, is extremely important. The other thing is estate planning. You have to prepare in this way. You know, Dave Ramsey says, everybody over the age of 18 should have a will. <clears throat> estate planning is something that is very specific for each individual. It accomplishes different goals. 
It could get very complicated depending on the type of individual you are, or it could be very simple. But estate planning is very important to prepare for. And so I want to go over a few of these different terms that we hear when we, when we talk about estate planning. So the first one <clears throat> is the will. So a will or last will and testament is a signed legal binding document that describes exactly how you want your assets like property, bank accounts, <clears throat> other things that you own to be handled after you, after you die. And it also documents guard, guard, guardian, guardianship. Guardianship, there you go. Sorry, my ninth grade education is coming out on me. So it also documents, you know, who, who, who's able to get your kids and all that. The other thing is power of attorney. So a power of attorney is used to give someone, which is called an agent, the authority to make certain decisions when you can't speak for yourself. And then there's also medical directives, medical directives or health power of attorneys. And this is the same thing. It gives somebody an agent. It gives them permission to carry out your medical wishes if you can't. The other thing is a trust. A trust is a fund that owns someone's stuff that spells out how you want to distribute when, when in the trust after the original owner dies. So, or what's in the trust, I'm sorry, after the original owner dies. Almost everything can be placed in a trust that has value. Um, it can go, so here are some examples, right? So real estate, uh, bank accounts, savings accounts, vehicles, fine art, even intellectual property, like if you own some type of business or some type of uh, intellectual property and stuff like that. And so these are the things that eventually we should be preparing for. We should talk about with our families. We should talk about with our spouse. If, if we're young, we should think about how we're going to prepare for these things. But this is all the things that we need to have in order so that the reality is they say 10 out of 10 people are going to die. Okay, that was a joke. Anyways, but the reality is that we're all going to pass one day, and so we have to have our stuff in order. So preparation is very important. But the last thing is education. So two things that your kids will never learn in school, even though they go for a PhD. They'll never learn biblical principles, and they'll never learn financial literacy. That's why the, the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, is so famous, because he's teaching people what we didn't learn in school, and the crazy thing is, uneducated people are the ones that teach this because it's the reality of life financial literacy is not taught in school passing on generational wealth is one of the hardest things you can do and especially if your children don't share the same values or same principles it's very hard to do so here's some statistics on passing down generational wealth only three, family, only three out of ten families succeed in maintaining their wealth into the next generation. The other one is nine out of ten families, wealthy families, lose their wealth in the third generation. So money doesn't matter if it doesn't have values attached to it. We know about uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt. This is an industrialist. He was... A very, very uh, successful businessman back in the 1980s. He took $100 from his mother that his mother gave him, and he turned it into $100 million. In our day, that would be equivalent to $200 billion. He had 13 children, and he only equipped one of his sons to take over his money in his business. And that son was able to take that $100 million and turn it into $200 million. That's over $400 billion. But within 50 years of his death, $400 billion were gone. You think, how can you spend $400 billion? Well, they did it. So it doesn't matter the amount of money that we have, that we have to pass down to our kids. What matters is, if we're able to educate them. 
It makes no sense to pass down family wealth if we're not going to educate our children. The lack of financial education will lead to a poor money management, an entitlement mentality that will squander everything rapidly. Proverbs 22, 6 says, point your kids in the right direction when, and, and when they're old, they won't be lost. You can ask any relay racer. Relay racers, there's usually four. They're passing a baton. They're trying to win a contest. You can ask any relay racer and they'll tell you that it's not the fastest relay runners that win the race. It's the ones that are able to pass the baton. And when you're passing the baton, someone's responsible to pass it. Someone's responsible to grab it. And so this is a joint effort, right? So this is why our kids, the next generation needs to be involved also. You know, when we hear legacy, it's not hard for us to understand what legacy is, especially if we come to this church. It's right there in our hallway every day when we pass by. We can see it. And it's such a great uh, example, it's such a great testimony that we're able to associate the word legacy with someone. And I actually took a picture of it for those that have never been to our church that are watching online. So that's our wall, right? It's a testimony of Pastor Mitchell. The life that he lived was very focused, imparting, preparing, investing into people for the kingdom of God. You can take that on. But what's crazy is that for that to continue, something else needs to happen. You know, I had been watching Pastor Greg preach, and in one of his, one of his uh, sermons, He was preaching about money and dominion. And uh, he was talking about his dad, about how his dad was able to get dominion over money. And the illustration that he used, or the story that he used, is that the Prescott Church hasn't always been financially blessed. That there was actually a pastor several years before Pastor Mitchell that had uh, taken over the church, and he had left because he said, there's no money in Prescott. So he took another pastoring job somewhere else. And you'll never guess who the pastor was. You know, from the movie Jesus, um, what was it? Jesus Revolution, that guy. So Chuck Smith, he was the pastor at the time. He's the one that said um, there was no money in Prescott, and so he left. Pastor Mitchell, years later, he takes the church, and he's able to establish that dominion over money and God's able to build a whole fellowship through his faith, through his faithfulness, and through that church. And so this is Pastor, this is Pastor Greg seeing his dad able to establish dominion over money. In another teaching, he was talking about, it was like a Sunday school, he was talking about that his dad was one of the most generous people he ever knew. He actually said, my dad is the most generous person in the world. And if you think about that, it's like maybe some people can argue that, right? Was he really the most in all the world, in all humanity? But you know what? To Pastor Greg, he was the most generous person he ever knew. And when it came to God and it came to money, Pastor Greg had a reference right there in his home. He didn't have to go look outside to somebody else's story to understand generosity, to understand what it was to, to have dominion with money. And this is and this is, should be our goal, that we could impact our kids this way, that we could show them when it comes to God and money, we can show them that example. You know, Pastor uh, Wayman Mitchell's um, legacy will continue to live on because of the way Pastor Greg has received that and what he's doing with it. His, Pastor Mitchell's convictions, wisdom, testimony, along with his vision and structure, everything that God gave him will continue to, to live on because of how Pastor Greg has received it. I think we have a picture, right? Um, show the next picture. So, yeah. so anybody that's been to pastor's office sees this picture all the time, right? But if I understand this story correctly, and I didn't, you know, go, go and confirm. But if I understand the story correctly, this is when Pastor 
Mitchell's handing over the fellowship. He's praying for Pastor Greg. And this looks amazing, right? Every, we all wish that we could have something so great, so big to pass down to our kids and all that. But the reality is that should be our goal. With what, whatever God has given to us, whatever God has put in our hands, that should be our goal, that we'll have the ability to pass that down, that vision, that perspective that God has given us we should be able to pass it down to our kids also. So that's, that should be our goal. That's good for them. Proverbs 1, 8 through 9 says, My son, <clears throat> hear the instructions of your father and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be grace, graceful ornament on your head and chains around your neck. The reality is that our kids have to value and want what we have if they're going to be able to receive what God has done in our lives also. But regardless if they want it or not, our job is to educate. <clears throat> so what should we teach them? We should teach them, or we should try to impart godly wisdom and values. We should explain to them and show them our purposes. Everybody's purpose and will is different. God has something specific for all of us, and it is up to us to share that with our kids, to impart that into our kids. You know, life is simple and enjoyable when we know God's purpose and we're fulfilling that. Like I said, the vision, the vision that God has given us for our family should be passed down also. And maybe, like I said, maybe you're here and you're like thinking, man, this is not for me, you know? I'll never have so much to pass down. But whatever you have is what God has given you. And that we should be able to pass down. You know, I talked about my grandmother. You know, my grandmother was a, was a strong woman. She was a strict woman. She really believed in spare the rod, spoil the child, you know. Every time I would see her, I would go to her and I'd say, hi, hey, grandma, how you doing? I'd give her a kiss. I'd give her a hug. And she would hit me when she was done. It's true, Iris is here, she can confirm. But she, I'd say, why you hit me? And she said, I know you're doing something wrong, so I'm, I have to hit you. <laughs> and I'm like, man, she doesn't even know anything. But, you know, like I said, my grandma had to figure out her way. She was a very hardworking woman. She, was, she loved God. She was a giver. She was very responsible. She had 13 brothers and sisters. And all her brothers and sisters counted on her for prayer. The crazy thing is that her family, out of all these 13 brothers and sisters, her family, her kids, were the most blessed. Her grandchildren were the most successful. So a lot of her children, or she had five children, most of her children became financially independent in their 50s. Her grandchildren be began to become financially independent in their 30s, in their 40s. If they weren't professionals, they were business owners. And it makes sense now because they told us, if you don't go to school, you've got to go to work. And so some of us chose to go to work, right? We didn't want to go to school. But my grandmother imparted her values of God, of working. She imparted those into her grandchildren. She showed them, you know, putting God first was the most important thing. You know, if you bought a new car, you knew that you had to go from the dealership to your grandmother's house because she wanted to make sure you were going to thank God for your new blessing. She wanted to make sure that you were, she was going to pray that God protected you. You know, when I came to church, I'm sitting in service. It's the first week that I'm here, and I hear, you should tithe. Because God, if you tithe, God will bless you. It was like, oh, yeah, tithing. It's no problem. It wasn't a problem for me to tithe because my grandmother taught me before I got saved that you needed to tithe. Now, I know some people at the beginning, they'll struggle with it. God's got to give them that revelation about tithing. But for me, it was extremely easy because my grandma had already taught me. So what we do matters. It doesn't matter if you have a lot or if you have a little, but what we do matters because people are watching us. You know, the book of Proverbs was written from a dad to his son. 
yeah, it was King Solomon, but all he was trying to accomplish was he was trying to educate his son. There's 31 chapters in, in, the, in the book of Proverbs. And if you read one every day, like today's the first, read the first, tomorrow's the 20th, read the 20th. Like if you do that every single day as part of your reading, the Proverbs will never get old. They'll always speak to you. But 23 times King Solomon addresses his son. It says, my son, 23 times. You know, when pastor said, hey, do you think you would want to do these classes? Or, you know, as you can tell, <clears throat> I'm not the best speaker. It's like um, the guy from Chick-fil-A, Kathy Truitt. He's, if you would ever hear him speak, it would be like, if we gave him a mic, you know? But he says, he said one time, I realized that if they've invited me to speak, it's not because I'm the best speaker. It's because of all the success I've had, you know? But anyways. But, um, you know, when he asked, I said, you know what? I wouldn't mind doing that because it's a reference that my children and my grandchildren can, can have one day. You know, I can pass down something that I was taught. How many of you guys believe that God's plan for our lives sometimes are much bigger than we understand, much bigger than we realize? You know, when I opened up, you know, to do these classes, I talked about how God inspired me by someone's testimony, how God used another man's life to show me what he could do in my life. I want to show you who that is. Uh, go ahead and show that picture. This is uh, Ray Villarreal Jr. and Vivian Villarreal. This is the man that they told me about. This is the man that they said, you know, he was going to get divorced. He came to the altar. He prayed. God, he got radically saved. And God changed his life. And it was like a, you know, like from one minute to the next, right? Instantly made him a success, you know? And they told me, and I was like, wow, really? Wow, it's crazy. God can do that. But the crazy thing about this story is that, that I just found out not too long ago. I was, me and my wife were visiting with, with Vivian. The crazy thing about this story is that, yes, it was true. He was going to get divorced. He got saved, and God saved his marriage. But no one knows the backstory is that he wanted the divorce from his wife, and it was him that was trying to pursue this, and his wife didn't let it happen. For six months, his wife fasted and prayed and believed God for their marriage. And she said she ended up losing almost 50 pounds just from praying and fasting. And then one day she gets a call from her husband and says, hey, there's a man that where I work that's inviting us to go to church. Do you think you'd want to go? She was already attending another church. And she said, I'll go anywhere just so that you can hear God's word. Comes to the church, gets saved. Radically changed. She said it took him five months for his life to completely turn around. His life changed. And he went to the altar and he asked the pastor, what can I do to change my life? I'm going to lose everything if I get divorced. Everything that I've worked for is going to go down the drain. And he said, honor God and God will bless you. And then he became a success. So that's good with that one. But this is the guy they told me about. You know what I appreciated so much about him was that he loved teaching. He enjoyed teaching. He had that heart of a teacher. And when he taught, he didn't just teach on his own ideas. He referenced everything from the Bible. He shared his personal life. He shared his mistakes, his failures, his success for my benefit so that I could learn. And when he taught, he taught with a passion. You know, I talked about how the book of Proverbs was a reference from a dad to their son, to his son. Well, it was crazy, but I, had, I found out later that Ray did this for his kids also. You can show those pictures. So his son sent these to me, and so he left biblical, he left scriptures that backed up the structure of his business. You can go to the next one. He left <clears throat> studies of the most important things in life. Biblical stewardship, financial planning, principles of financial success, goals, 
lifestyle, borrowing and debt, bankruptcy, charity, charitable giving, investment, work, retirement, net worth, income tax, life insurance, wealth transfer, and training children. When I saw this, this was crazy. I couldn't believe it. Go to the next one. He left a prayer journal. Everything from praying for his kids to his wife to his business to all kinds of things. You can, that's good with that. You know, and in this, and in these notes, it's, it talks about that he didn't get to meet God till he was 29 years old. That the, all the trouble that he had in life was very easy to be fixed. All you had to do was go to the Bible. He says this, Roman and Aaron, your father did not read or understand the Bible until I was 21 years old. Looking at the Bible today, I see that many of life's problems were addressed in the Bible. This book will f- help you find every aspect of life. Some of the issues follow. How to get to heaven. How to be happy. How to be, all- how to be well off financially. How to have peace. Defeat Satan. Be humble. Pray. Have a Christian life. Have the right heart and attitude. And then he goes on to say this. I raise the two of you to see... Your father read the Bible every morning before going out to work and even on the weekends. And then he follows it up with this scripture, Deuteronomy 6, 6. These words which I command you to, which, these words which I command you today shall be in your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. He cared about teaching. This was a quality that he had. But like Vivian says, his wife, he graduated into heaven in his mid-40s. He went on to be with Jesus. You know, we saw that, um, we saw that picture of them. That was when they were younger. And so I, I began to meet him back in 2000, about 2006. And so a lot of people say, you talk about him like if you've known him all your life. The reality is I only knew him from 2006 to 2012. It was in those years that he was able to teach me. He spent time with me. He visited my business. And a lot of things I was able to learn from him. And he really made a big impact in my life. He was willing to impart his knowledge, his principles, his values into my life. You know, when Pastor Betha was doing the podcast... A couple years ago, in that podcast, I talk about him a little bit, talk about, you know, how God has blessed me in the, different, in the process and different things like that. And that, that podcast gave me the opportunity to be able to connect with his children. And so through that podcast, we were able to start talking and eventually to build a relationship. And so... Um, I'm going to show this picture. Go ahead and, and put that up. So this, was, uh, this would be like 2012. And so Roman, he's, uh, he's on your right, right, or your left. He's on this side. <laughs> and Roman is 17 years old. Aaron, the younger one, he's 15 years old. His daughter, Vanessa, is 12 years old. And so they say around this time was the last time that they would talk to their dad or that he would talk back to them. This is around that time. And so this was, this, around this time would be the last time that I, I would also talk to him. And so it's really crazy that in that short amount of time, you know, he would make such a make such an impact but you know everything that he would taught me that he taught me everything that he would all his principles all his values the way he would do business it's good with that picture all that I absorbed he's the one that showed me or where I picked up the the um the quote when the student is ready the teacher will appear Because when you're ready to learn, you'll absorb as much as you can. 
And so I was about 26 when I began to meet him and talk to him. He was about 40 in his mid-40s or early 40s. You know, today, um, his son's here with us today, his son and, and his wife and his uh, and Romanson. But when I was, when we would begin to talk and, 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 and he would begin to give me time, that was, I was about, you know, like I said, I was in my mid-20s, he was in his mid-40s. You know, today, his sons visit me in my office. You know, my office is set up exactly the way that his, his dad's, uh, their dad's office was. And they sit there and they ask me questions. They get my perspective. And a lot of the things that I tell them is, when it comes to this, this is what your dad would say. When it comes to this, this is what I believe because this is what he say. Talking about partnerships, you're talking about borrowing money, building business, structuring things. Whatever it is, I'm able to look at his kids and I'm able to speak the same principles, the same values, the same ideas. And now, Ray used to always tell me, he used to say, I have a rocking chair mentality. He says, one day I'm going to be sitting in a rocking chair and I don't want to have any regrets. So we know that his plan or his idea was never going to come to this. You know, he, was, he wasn't going to pass early, you could say. But he also didn't know that everything that he invested into my life, I was going to be able to turn around and invest into his kid's life. And that's what happens when you believe in a legacy, when you believe in teaching, when you believe in God's word and being a good steward over what God has placed in your hands. You know, I, I showed you those notes that he would write to his kids, and one of those was a, the prayer journal. And in that prayer journal, the last prayer that he noted in there was, I pray that God could and would use my life as a testimony. And I believe that God answered his prayer. I don't think that I can ever talk about money, business, give advice without saying, yeah, this is what my mentor would say. Or this is what my financial advisor would say. And so the amount of impact that we can make if we take this seriously. You know, Ray would say, <clears throat> if you were my little brother, I would be proud of you. And one of the last things that he told me when he was really focused on teaching me was, I know that if I teach you, you can be a blessing to the church and you can teach other people. And now we're here. I didn't, when he would tell me things, I, didn't, I couldn't see it. I couldn't connect the dots. And when he would tell me, you know, financial success is just about taking God's word and making good decisions, and allowing time to play out, it was almost inevitable. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't see it. When he would tell me, be good with money, and you'll never have a problem with money. Banks will always want to lend you money. People will always want to do business with you. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't see it. But he could see something that I couldn't see, and what he could see was that he already knew that how God moved in his life, and how God can move in other people's lives. They say legacy is our faith, ethics, core values, along with monetary assets. That's what legacy is. So we have the, the ability to do that, to build that wealth, to prepare for our families, and to be able to educate our children so we can pass that down. And so... In saying that, that's all I have for tonight.